Okay. People are still coming in and joining. So glad to have you. I'll probably get started um, because we have a tight schedule today on some of the logistics announcements. Uh, again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, your name, location. We're so, so glad to have you today. Um, my name is Kate Henderson. I am MSH's Management Science for Health uh, technical Director for Leadership and Governance. I will be your host for today, um, and it's great to be together. We have a very exciting agenda, which you can see on the slide, so I won't read it out for you. Um, but I'm going to briefly share about a few technology things. Uh, maybe many of you are familiar with Zoom, but just in case. Um, if you need live captions, you can go down to the bottom of your screen. There is a toolbar. You click on um, the captions button uh, box, and you can click to show captions and choose your language. We also are offering live interpretation uh, in this session. Uh, in both, there will be panelists speaking in both English and Spanish. So if you don't speak both English and Spanish, I would recommend that you turn on the interpretation function. The way that you do that is again to go down and click on the interpretation box. And this will allow you to choose which language you'd like to listen in on. So you can choose English or Spanish, and then the rest of the webinar you will hear in the language of your preference. And again, those are all at the bottom of your screen. There'll also be some instructions in the chat to explain that. We'd love to have you participate in the webinar today. There are two ways to do that. One is through the chat function, which many of you are already doing, but in case you don't see the chat, you can go down again to the bottom of your screen um, in the toolbar, and there is a chat option. You can click on that. It will bring your chat up, and you should be able to see the conversation and participate. Um, we also want to have uh, some Q&A later on, so at any point during the session, if you have a question for one of, or more of the panelists or for us, you can click on the Q&A button, enter your question, uh, and click send. So again, welcome everyone um, to our webinar today. Uh, we are excited to talk about uh, the road to resilient public health systems and share a people-centered approach to strengthening emergency preparedness and response. I'm gonna get, start off by giving you a little background on the Leading Managing uh, for Results in Pandemics program, which is the intervention that we will be sharing about today. The National Public Health Institute's project, funded by the U.S. Center for Disease Control and led by Management Sciences for Health, launched in late 2020 in the thick of the COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> you probably all remember this, but decision makers at all levels were overwhelmed with multiple overlapping shocks, not just from the pandemic, but from its aftermath and all of the economic and political uh, turmoil. Leaders were struggling to prioritize needs, make rapid decisions, communicate quickly and effectively to the public, mobilize resources, access and use of the evolving evidence, navigate all the politics of the response and more. So in response, MSH built on more than three decades of our experience in strengthening local leadership management and governance capacity in health systems and designed the Leading and Managing for Results and Pandemics program, which you will hear about today. We call it the LMRP. The LMRP is one of the only packaged leadership development programs that is designed to be used by real work teams in the midst of managing a real public health emergency. The program combines digital learning, team coaching, application, and reflection to enhance leadership and management skills while accompanying these teams as they develop and implement local solutions that advance their country's public health, emergency preparedness, response, and recovery efforts. There's a video about the program. If you haven't had a chance to look at it, it was uh, in the invitation for this webinar, and I suggest you do that um, at your own time. 
Uh, national and subnational teams representing national um, public health institutes, emergency operations centers, and other response structures participated in LMRPs across six countries in Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria, Peru, Rwanda, and Uganda. Given the increasing prevalence of public health emergencies and the growing understanding of the importance of resilient public health systems, we all know from the latest PEPFAR strategy, Pillar 3, and its call to invest in MPHIs is just one example of this. So we thought it was essential to document, evaluate, and share our experience. Today, you will hear about the power of teams. You'll hear stories about increasing va vaccine coverage, establishing emergency broadcast systems, strengthening event-based surveillance, and more. And you'll also explore da data on how the LMRP contributed to those achievements. But first, I would like to warmly welcome champions of the LMRP program joining us from the CDC. Uh, Shelly Bratton, who is the lead for the National Public Health Institute program, and Brianna Lucido, a public health ana analyst um, with the Workforce Development Branch. So I'll first turn it over to uh, Shelly to uh, share her opening remarks. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks so much, Kate. Much appreciated. It is a real pleasure to be here today. Um, I'd like to thank Management Sciences for Health for their partnership and their expertise that brought this program into existence. As Kate mentioned, I'm Shelley Bratton. I lead CDC's National Public Health Institute program. We work closely with countries to establish new or strengthen existing NPHIs, which is a country's focal point for public health. NPHIs serve as the center of gravity for public health activities and are the technical public health arm of the Ministry of Health. The additive value of any NPHI is having data readily available for decision making. That means knowing what diseases are affecting the population, when and where, and being ready to respond if something out of the ordinary happens. The NPHI role in emergency preparedness and response links directly to what we will hear today from our partner countries. I would like to congratulate all the participants in the Leading and Managing for Results in Pandemics program. I look forward to hearing about your accomplishments and thinking together about how we can share this learning further with other NPHIs. I will now turn to Brianna Lucido. Brianna. Thanks, Shelley. Um, and as Shelly said, hello everyone. My name is Brianna Lucido and I am a public health analyst in the Division for Global Health Protection at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In my role at CDC, I support the field epidemiology training program and specifically the curriculum and training needs of FETP residents and alumni. FETPs are usually housed within MPHIs and build a critical component of the response workforce. CDC partnered with Manage Management Sciences for Health to design and deliver the leading and managing for results in pandemics program. This stemmed out of a need to improve the speed, flexibility, and effectiveness of countries' COVID-19 preparedness, response, and recovery efforts by strengthening leadership and management in the health sector. CDC sought to develop a platform for developing the leadership and management capacities of FETP alumni, engaging them through existing networks and building on knowledge they gained about public health emergency response from FETP so they can successfully take on urgent challenges emerging from the global pandemic and contribute to effective national and local preparation, response, and recovery efforts. The lessons learned in this program will be important for future leadership and management training programs, especially for the field epidemiology training program residents and alumni. Increased leadership and management capacity will render alumni and residents better equipped to more effectively manage the epidemic responses enabling better stewardship of scarce resources, more transparent decision-making, evidence-informed prioritization of urgent activities, and, collaborate, and collaborative learning and adaptation. I am honored and delighted to be with you all today. 
Most importantly, I'm excited to hear about the great work that you've completed through the LMRP program and the lessons that you have learned. Thank you for your work and I'm looking forward to hearing your presentations today. And now I'm going to hand it back to Kate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shelly and Brianna. Uh, we've been so grateful for CDC's support in this program, um, not just from a funding perspective, but really from a thought, um, a partnership perspective and, and uh, contributing to its co-creation. So, so thank you for bringing your expertise to this table. Um, now I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Warira Muni. Uh, she's a longtime champion of growing leadership skills and pu for public health professionals and works with me at Management Sciences for Health. She's currently the country project director for our health systems for tuberculosis project in Kenya and was the senior regional program manager for the LMRP. Warira, over to you. Thank you so much, Kate. I appreciate that introduction. And I am truly excited to co-moderate this webinar today. We are going to begin by introducing three team representatives of the LMRP program, who will share a little bit about the challenges they identified to address using the learnings from the program. Each of them has a unique story and I'm glad they could join today. So today we are going to hear from Simon uh, Chaze, who is, um, excuse me, who is the head of operations at um, National Public Health Emergency Operations Center in uh, Uganda. And um, I'm glad you could join us today, Simon. We also have, um, we also have Yahya Disu, head of corporate communication for risk communication and community engagement at Nigeria's Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Thanks, Disu, for being here today. And we will hear from Julian Nyigabira, the Health Communications Division Manager at the Rwanda Biomedical Center. Welcome, uh, Julian. Each of our speakers will talk about Excuse me. We'll talk about the challenge they identified during the LMRP that they committed to solving. We call this the challenge statement. They will also share their desirable me measurable results, which is a specific target that they set out to achieve. And I'm certain you will be impressed by the achievements of the teams represented here today. If you have any questions for our speakers, I encourage you to share them as we will have a brief Q&A session after our first three speakers. And just, and just um, a quick reminder that any questions you have for our speakers may be entered into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And so we are going to begin uh, with Uganda and I will begin uh, with you, Simon. If you could please tell us about your challenge statement and the results that you worked towards achieving. Over to you, Simon. Thank you very much, uh, Wawira. Um, like uh, Wawira said, I'm Simon I'm from Uganda. I uh, head operations at the National um, Emergency Operations Center. And um, a, a part of what we do, uh, actually a very big component of what we do at the Emergency Operations Center is early warning for the government. And um, a big component of that is surveillance. And, uh, and there are two critical um, pillars of surveillance, um, indicator-based surveillance and uh, event-based surveillance. And event-based surveillance is what we uh, consider, um, um, you know, for 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 preparedness and response uh, to emergencies in the country, uh, where we get information coming in from different channels, unstructured information coming in, and and we make sense of that at the center, and uh, send it to our superiors who make the decisions um, um, to do the response to these emergencies. Um, this event the surveillance um, um, is new and not very well understood around the country uh, by some of our stakeholders and also some of the people in the community where we want this information to come. So um, we 
where really had we really had a challenge of um, of um, having uh, the, the 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 story and um, the news of event based surveillance spread out throughout the country, and that was a little bit of a challenge. So our challenge statement for that was how will we implement a functional event based surveillance system um, in the country um, in light of law sensitization on emergency uh, on on event based surveillance and inadequate technical and financial support, but we wanted to take baby steps. So we wanted to start from one region. So we modified that to one region of the country, which is the Fort Porter region. And uh, therefore our measurable result after doing um, a lot of work was to implement a functional event-based surveillance system in Fort Porter region by December, 2022, starting April, 2022. So that is that was our measurable result. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, and I can hope that you are able to achieve that result. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Now we will move to Nigeria. So um, we will now hear from Yahya. Yahya, please tell us what your challenge was and how you and your team, what you and your team achieved. What was your result? Uh, good morning or good afternoon all. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my team is Team Excellence. Um, my organization, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control and Prevention, has actually a zero tolerance policy for sexual harassment. Uh, this is evidenced by the organization sexual harassment policy, as well as the confidential reporting mechanism to put in place to ensure that victims are safe uh, when the report. Uh, other available services in the organization include victims counseling services, legal assistance, and other employee assistance programs. However, the issue of low awareness uh, among the staff of the planning, research, and statistics department uh, about sexual harassment, its impact, as well as um, the stigmatization of sexually harassed victims was a significant concern for the team. And so um, our challenge statement was, how will we achieve a 20% increase in awareness among staff of the department uh, who are sensitized on the SCDC sexual harassment policy within the month of March 2023, considering the limited time that we have and conflicting priorities for both our team members and the department. And then we were able to achieve that, and we we actually exceeded that target, that twenty percent target. I'm really pleased to see that. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, um, Yahya. It's great to hear that you exceeded your target, and I hope that you will not uh, stop there. You did not stop that you have continued to actually work towards increasing uh, that number. So thank you very much. Now we move to Rwanda. We would like to hear how Rwanda performed and what their challenge was. So Julian, if you could please um, tell us uh, your experience, what challenge did you identify with your team and what result did you achieve? Over to you, Julian. Uh, thank you, Awira. Um, uh, our team was the public health risk communication and community engagement team. We are staff from uh, the Rwanda Biomedical Center, which uh, deals with mostly coordinating of all the health communication uh, in the country. So our challenge was to um, was how uh, we could increase the COVID-19 vaccine uptake, uh, despite existing religious beliefs that were thought to, to fuel hesitancy and vaccine resistance. Uh, some people have uh, resisted to take the vaccine. Some people have really, really gone with a lot of skepticism because of uh, their religious belief. So we wanted to drive uh, sensitization efforts. We want to drive uh, communication efforts so that we can deal with, uh, with that uh, skepticism. And our measurable result was to drive an increase of 5% uh, 
uh, vaccination numbers in some specific uh, districts, uh, which were where, where the data was showing us that uh, we were facing uh, religious beliefs uh, impacting the vaccine rollout. So uh, the issue uh, with the religious belief was that some members could not uh, take the vaccine because they associated the vaccine with uh, some uh, prophecies in the holy books and so on and so forth. So our result or our joy was to find out that we have realized that target and that we not only have achieved the increase of 5%, but almost doubled it and uh, increased the vaccine uptake to almost 10%. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Julian. I have a couple of more questions for our panelists and I'll go to you, Simon. Uh, please tell us, what is it about the results you achieved, you and your team, that made you feel the most proud? Yeah, so um, for uh, Uganda, like I said, um, event the surveillance um, was a relatively new concept for many, um, but we were able to um, do a successful cascade in the region. We cascaded in five out of nine districts in the country. Um, 60 facilities were reached and over 800 community members. So it was like a training of trainers and then a cascade down to the community. And, and now we're proud to say that these community health volunteers are able to interact with the surveillance system um, and able to send these signals these, um, and we're able to do proper um, event-based surveillance um, with them. And this ensures uh, um, reduced critical time to respond to emergencies within that region. Um, and um, the fact that it's a new concept, aligning a national and regional stakeholders was a little bit of a challenge, but now we are proud to say that um, given um, the, the, the successes and the stories that are being told by, uh, by, uh, by, by the system itself, um, they have uh, a pledge to, to provide financial support and technical support. And uh, we have able to co been able to co-op many of our, um, um, our development partners like Africa CDC, CDC and WHO who are now, um, um, who have even the surveillance on top of the agenda. And also us at the team, um, at the team at the national level, we are able to work more cohesively because we now realize that uh, if we work together, we can be able to tackle these challenges. And, um, and, 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 you know, last but never least, also uh, the Minister of Health has prioritized uh, even best surveillance a rollout. And um, um, it's one of the, of it's, it's within its um, um, integrated disease surveillance and response guidelines, uh, the third national guidelines of um, IDSR. Thank you, over. Thank you very much, Simon. Well done, uh, good job. Yahya, what about you? What made you feel most proud of the results that you and your team achieved? Okay, uh, as a team, our initial uh, aim was to increase awareness by 20%. But we're able to increase awareness by 56%, and moving from 38% baseline to 94%. Well, this achievement uh, is actually a proof of the meticulous planning, tireless effort, and commitments of the team. And it signifies the knowledge gained from the training uh, to execute plan and coordinate effectively as a team. So I think uh, that's what we're proud of because we had a very short time and we're able to deliver uh, to, uh, to exceed expectation. Thank you. Well said, well said, Yahya. Uh, Julian, same question to you. What made you feel the most proud um, of achieving uh, you and your team. Thank you, Awira, once again. Um, what made us most proud uh, is that not only we have achieved the target we had of 5%, I have uh, initially said that, but the result showed us that acceptance increased to almost 10% in the mentioned districts. So, but also we have driven very powerful engagements with the religious leaders so that uh, the pastors, the priests, and so on, could anchor uh, the, the messages, the sensitization messages uh, from the Ministry of Health to their congregations during church services. Uh, 
And uh, we have also worked with the vaccinations team so that Christians or maybe church members, uh, I'm mentioning Christians because most of the religious uh, beliefs that were preventing people to take vaccine were from the Bible. But uh, we have worked also with vaccination teams so that uh, they can set up vaccination sites at the church premises so that congregations could get their vaccine right after uh, the churches. So it was like uh, the, the most pr proud thing, that we, the, the most realizations that we're proud of. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Julian, for that and for those efforts. Uh, on the next question for each of you, before we turn it over to our audience uh, for their own questions, Simon, um, I'll, I'll go to you first again. What was the most difficult obstacle you faced during this process and how did you address it? Yeah, so um, thank you very much, Wawira. So our, our unit um, is, um, is does a lot of coordination of uh, public health emergencies. Um, while we're doing this course, we, we had up to about maybe eight um, um, emergencies that were handling at the, at, the, at, the, at the same time. I think we're still doing a bit of COVID and uh, we had uh, Rift Valley fever. I think at that point we even had Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever and some measles at some at some places and cholera because in, in Uganda, we have so many emergencies uh, and, and, and our unit does a lot of coordination with stakeholders, with partners. Um, so um, prioritizing the LMRP course um, among these different coordination tasks that we're supposed to do uh, was a, a little bit of a challenge. But um, with the support of our leadership and also um, the fact that we knew that uh, the importance of leadership in, um, in, in managing uh, um, um, pandemics, we decided to prioritize. So we decided to work as a team and, mm -hmm. and, and took on little bite-sized pieces for each of, of, of the team to be able to complete the course. And I'm proud to say that we're able to complete the course in time um, um, amidst, amidst all the other challenges that we had over. Great, great. Well said, Simon. Um, Yahya, what about you? What was the greatest challenge you faced uh, during this experience and how did you address it? Okay. Uh, the significant challenge that we had was time because our initial project was to go to the community about a COVID-19 vaccination. But uh, due to bureaucracy, uh, right from the community, the local council area and the states that in federal capital territory area, so we're not able to achieve much and we push for months. But later, we also realized that um, awareness about sexual harassment within the organization was an issue following the town hall meeting that was organized uh, in the month of February. And we saw that um, many staff did not even know their rights. And meanwhile, the organization had the policy. So due to um, change, in um, focus and then the short time that we have to do this. So we have to approach this as a cohesive team, understanding that uh, each members uh, have strengths and weaknesses. So we assign roles and tasks based on this the expertise uh, of the members and in order to maximize their strengths. And then the limited time frame that we had uh, made us to reevaluate our priorities and then also to also ensure teamwork flexibility and and as well as um and, and the commitment of the team and to achieving our goals and uh, was what really contributed to the success that we achieved. And then on the side of uh, the staff that we had to engage, they also had conflicting priorities. They couldn't leave their work to come and attend uh, the uh, the workshop we were planning for them. So we had to proactively engage the director of the department, we wrote uh, a letter explaining the objectives and the issues that we identified during the town hall meeting and the relevance to staff. So she agreed with us and she was able to write a letter to all staff that this is important for them to achieve. And that way uh, we were able to conduct the workshop. And then uh, the department was also so happy because uh, the workforce uh, division in the department I've been looking for opportunity to carry out enlightenment of, us on, uh, of staff on this uh, sexual harassment policy. So they gain insight on how to do it uh, after our project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yahya. Great strategies there. 
Julian, uh, over to you. What was the greatest challenge uh, you faced during this experience? Uh, thank you. Um, aside that uh, religious beliefs are in themselves uh, a hectic challenge to deal with, but also we have realized that the one of the most, the biggest challenges we faced was the, the nature of the vaccine uh, itself, because COVID-19 vaccine kept calling people for, for additional doses. And the more you called people to take additional doses, uh, the, the hardest it, real, it, it was to convince them to come and uh, take the, the vaccine. So we have addressed this challenge in two ways. Um, one was to continue to provide uh, information about the vaccine, showing people how it was helping them to, back, to go back to normalcy. And by comparing the vaccination rates with um, the improvement of the situation regarding uh, COVID-19 uh, spreading. Uh, the second way we addressed the challenge was to be open. Uh, we chose to be open and uh, uh, telling the people what the science was uh, offering by the time and be able also to uh, to say that maybe science was not uh, has not yet been able to close some gaps in the questions that people were asking. Uh, so we were open and we provided information as the science could allow by the time we conducted the sensitization. Thank you. Great stuff. Great stuff. Thank you very much, uh, Julian. Now I will turn it over to our audience uh, for a brief um, Q and A session. And please don't hesitate to share your questions for our panelists in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So we will take a few questions uh, from the audience. All right, okay, we seem to be short of time. So please continue putting your questions in the in the in the box. And uh, we will proceed to the next session. And I want to thank to thank you, Simon, uh, Yahya, and Julian for your great responses and for the information and knowledge that you have shared. We will hear more about your experiences shortly. And now I'd like to introduce Paul, our next moderator. I will hand over to Paul, my colleague at MSH, who is a senior principal technical advisor for infectious diseases. Paul has a long and um, been an advocate for strengthening team action and decision making within the space of emergency management. So Paul, over to you. Thank you very much, Wawila. I hope colleagues, you can hear me well. Um, why I'm part of this discussion is because the world knows a lot, but they don't do what they know. And I think that's one of the fundamental reasons why we can have all the technology, we can have all the human resource, we can have all the finances, but we don't achieve the results that are needed. So this LMRP program, in my own view, is an effort to get better organization of the resources so they can deliver results by empowering the people who are behind all this, as you are hearing in the panels. So I'll continue by introducing the remaining team. Uh, we have two teams that are yet to share with us the experiences. One team from Malawi, unfortunately, could not join but we'll nevertheless continue with the two teams from Kenya and also from uh, Nigeria. Sorry, from Kenya and Peru. So with me here, we'll be hearing from Dennis Mateka, who is the Deputy Unit Head of the Nursing Services at the government of McQueen County in Kenya. Nice seeing you here, Dennis. And also joining us, is Maria Angelica, who is a nurse practitioner with the Regional Health Directorate of ICA in Peru. 
welcome Maria. So with that, uh, we would like to hear a little more on the challenge and the uh, measurable result. And I request Dennis to start with you. Could you tell us about your challenge statement and your result very briefly? Over to you, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Waibale. Uh, for Makweni County, our challenge was around increasing COVID-19 vaccination coverage from a baseline of 28.7. The reason as to why we picked this challenge is Makweni County. It is because after we did an internal and external environment scanning, it was so clear that Makweni County, we had a challenge around COVID-19 vaccination because at the current time, we had a positivity rate of 15%. We also had a default rate of around 31%, translating to 179 people who are not, 1,000 people who are not vaccinated. And therefore, as Team Makweni, we chose to, to, to pick the COVID-19 immunization coverage as our challenge. Of course, with a measurable result to increase the COVID-19 vaccination to 45%. For the result, we were able to achieve that and we vaccinated 35,894, courtesy to the team spirit of Team McWenny. Thank you and back to you, Waibane. Thank you, Waibale. Uh, oh, you're muted. Paul, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you, unmute. So sorry, so sorry, so sorry. You hear me well now? Yes. Right. Yeah, so we are next hearing from Maria Angelica from Peru. Maria is speaking in Spanish. So I request that if you are not a Spanish speaker, you can now choose your language so you can be able to catch up with her. So Maria, over to you. What challenge did you identify and what was the result? that you are addressing in Peru. Over to you. Maria, are you there? Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Really, we are from the health area, we have a great team with different professions with the mystic of serving the population. And this has identified us a lot. We've had the great challenge of making up the community committees for COVID-19 in the population. It was a critical situation because we had to be isolated, but we had to reach out to the community and get organized. We had 10 committees for 17 districts, but we were able to persevere with our work in 43 districts of the whole region to give 100% because we understood how important it was to approach the community and these committees carry out important activities, the surveillance, the reference with all patients that want to present any, that had any symptoms. We would take phone calls and it was critical to make important decisions during this critical time in this community. So this allowed us to allow our community in the region and we complied with 100% for all our districts to have these committees in their communities. Thank you. 
Wow. <laughs> Amazing. 100% in the community, in the communities. Great. So I'll now follow up those stories from the two panelists with some more questions. Then I'll go with you first. Could you please tell us what it is about the result you achieved that made you feel the most proud? What made you feel yes. proud about the result? Uh, thank you, Waibale. Uh, for Team Makweni, we were proud to achieve over 35,000 complete COVID-19 vaccination in Makweni County because we used high impact and low cost intervention. That is, we had a multi-sectoral approach. We did community engagement and involvement around COVID-19 vaccination. So as to mitigate the vaccine hesitancy, we also did debunking of the myths around COVID-19 uh, vaccination. We also used another high impact low cost intervention of integrating COVID-19 vaccination in the routine immunization schedule. We also did advocacy, communication, and social mobilization. All these high impact low cost interventions, they led to one thing, and that, and that was improvement in health services and outcome around COVID-19 vaccination. Thank you, Waibad, and back to you. Wow, thank you very much, Dennis. Um, Maria, over to you. What made you feel very proud of the results that you achieved? With if our committees had gone more than beyond communicating with the authorities in the district saying we are here, major of the community, we need for the authorities to give us supplies to go to the communities and be prepared and to carry out three important activities that our families needed. So they contacted different institutions and NGOs to get all the necessary supplies. So I'm glad they went more than beyond. Thank you. I love the whole aspect of the community committees communicating with the authorities above. That's a very important, powerful tool that gets the resources to where they are needed most, but also brings the higher levels to be accountable to the communities. Thank you very much, Maria. So um, I will now want to take colleagues on the audience to the next set of questions with this panel uh, before we eventually go to the overall question and answer session. And I'll go with you, Dennis, first. What was the most difficult obstacle you faced during this process? And how did you address it? Thank you, Waibale. The big elephant in the room, the big obstacle for Makwene County was COVID-19 vaccination hesitancy. And therefore, as a team, we had to think and have a leadership, a change of mindset, because we had been doing COVID-19 vaccination for more than a year. And therefore, we approached that obstacle by conducting community sensitization on importance and safety of COVID-19 vaccination, engagement and involvement of key stakeholders at the community. We also did a service delivery redesigning, whereby we say we should have a one-stop shop in our service delivery points by integrating COVID-19 vaccination with other routine health services. Uh, we also did conducted targeted COVID-19 immunization outreach. As a team we have, because we have COVID-19 vaccination, who is this population that is not vaccinated? Where are they? And why are they not being vaccinated? And therefore, 
we debunked the myth as to why they were not being vaccinated. We located where they were through mapping, and we were able to do targeted COVID-19 immunization services to that area. And of course, we had a tremendous result as McQueen team. Thank you, Ibala, back to you, and over. Well, that's the kind of information that we are looking out because epidemics and pandemics will be here with us. But the fact that we can redesign, we can restructure our resources to be able to be funneled to the places where they needed most is the answer to early detection and early intervention. So thank you, Dennis, for that. How about you, Maria? Uh, what was the greatest obstacle that you faced and how did you overcome it? Yes, the schedule with staff members, most of us were working at the hospitals, so we needed to train our community to control this pandemic, so we had to organize ourselves and understand it was really important to do the empowerment with the participation of the population to organize the committees and we need a budget for that. So with the committees, we got the authorities to have a small budget and give sustainability. And that's what we're doing here in Peru. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Very, very impressive. Yeah. Thank you very much, Maria. We really appreciate the interventions that you did and how they eventually helped to improve the community communication. Now, colleagues, we are sort of running short of time and I'll only allow one question. So if I go to the QA, there's one question there. Um, I'm not sure for whom this one is addressed. How do we compare and contrast your findings to others? That is a question from Bahani Tesfan. Any of the panelists who would like to answer that question? How do you compare and contrast your findings to others? Uh, thank you, Waibale. Of course, uh, you realize what we applied in Makwene County, it was country, county, context, specific fit. And therefore, we had best lessons, best practices that we learned. And one was that for effectiveness in any uh, community pandemic, we need to have a teamwork. We need to have data to inform decision. We also need to do stakeholder mobilization, alignment, and of course we must have a vision in mind and with a challenge that is at heart for the team. And therefore it will fit depending on the country. So we cannot pick what succeeded in Makwene County for another country, but there are best practices that can be duplicated even globally. Thank you, Waibale. Yeah, thank you very much with that response. I will limit the question answer session now. And thank you, Dennis and Maria, for your availability and the hard work that you put into this. We will hear more about your experiences along later on with the other panelists after the presentation of the preliminary findings of the LMRP program evaluation, which was conducted by MSH and Nicole Carbon led that process. So Nicole Carbon is our monitoring and evaluation technical advisor at MSH, and I'd like to invite her to present the findings of the evaluation. Over to you, Nicole, please. Thank you so much, Paul, and good morning, good afternoon to everyone. So now we'll briefly discuss the evaluation that we at MSH conducted of the LMRP program. So the aim of our evaluation was to understand the outputs and intermediate outcomes of the LMRP program 
in Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria, Peru, Rwanda, and Uganda. We wanted to further understand reactions to the full course and whether the course achieved the objectives. And we explored a few different complexity aware monitoring methods for the evaluation, and we ultimately decided to use the outcome harvesting methodology. So the outcome harvesting methodology involves retrospectively collecting or harvesting evidence of what has changed from the perspective of the people closest to the intervention. The evaluators work backwards to understand how an intervention has contributed to those outcomes. And the picture on the right illustrates the six iterative steps involved in outcome harvesting, which all help to gather evidence-based answers to understand what happened and who contributed, and then ultimately to inform the program outputs and outcomes. And the LMRP evaluation adopted the iterative outcome harvesting approach with five key steps. Some of the highlights include step two, where additional qualitative data was collected from LMRP program participants and supervisors to inform the draft outcomes. Step three involved validation of the draft outcomes by LMRP program participants and supervisors to ensure that the outcomes are representative and in line with what those involved in the program also felt were key takeaways. Note that we omitted step four involving external substantiation. We modified the approach based on the fact that the other steps covered the core principles of outcome harvesting. And subsequent steps involve further analysis of the data and the outcomes and step six is where we are today, sharing some of the findings. An important thing to note is that the full evaluation report will be shared in the coming months once it's published. So here's an overview of the data collected from the LMRP program participants and supervisors, as well as the number of informants involved in validating the outcomes and outputs. Overall, 64 people were interviewed and 54 were involved in the validation of the draft outcomes and outputs. And so we now transition to sharing some of our results and findings from the qualitative and quantitative data. We show here some of the strengths of the findings across the six countries. And note the greenish color refers to a strong theme, yellow is an occasional theme, and orange is more of a minor theme. So here I want to draw your attention to the first row, looking at increased readiness to manage future pandemics, which was a strong theme across all countries, as well as the middle row, looking at increased planning, organizing, scanning, and inspiring behaviors, which are all leading and managing practices. On the other hand, the second to last row, looking at increased monitoring and evaluation behaviors, following LMRP program participation had more mixed results across all countries. So following the analysis of the results by country and the drafting and validation of the outputs and outcomes by country, we determined common themes across all countries. And as you can see here, we note six key emerging themes and outcomes which included improved teamwork, increased collaboration and trust, tools and skills gained to handle future pandemics, leadership skills gained, improved communication, and management of current disease outbreaks. So next we'll present a couple of illustrative quotes from the evaluation and have panel discussions focused on a, cue, a few of the key themes. So the first looking at readiness to manage future pandemics, and the second one looking at increased teamwork and leadership capacities. So I'll now pass it over to Arira for the first panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Nicole. Um, the overarching objective of the LMRP was to equip the participating teams with their leading and managing uh, skills uh, to be able to manage and respond to public health emergencies. And so in this um, next session, we will bring together all the panelists 
And we are going to move forward with discussing how the LMRP program has contributed to team readiness to handle current and future public health emergencies. And so um, here we see, sorry, my technology. Here are, are two illustrations on your, on your screen. Uh, we have two quotes uh, that highlight how the LMRP participants uh, reflect on being more prepared to handle future pandemics uh, compared to their preparedness for COVID-19. The second quote uh, that you see on the screen is from an informant in Malawi uh, that describes how the two the tools and skills gained are being applied to handle current disease and outbreaks like cholera. And so I will ask, I'll ask this question, uh, the one that you can see on the screen, to all the panelists. And the question is, to what extent has the LMRP helped you and your teams to be ready for future health crises? And I'm going to begin with the Uganda team represented by Simon. Simon, uh, why don't you tell us in response to that question? Thank you very much, Wawira. Um, um, in our, our business is um, preparedness and response uh, to pandemics, um, you know, in the country. And in, in, in what we do, um, we have a lot of priorities, as um, everyone who is who is who does a, a preparedness and response knows. So many priorities, and all these priorities need resources. However, when we focus on high impact priorities, um, only the high impact priorities, um, this influences how different um, government and key uh, development and implementing partners react and um, prioritize uh, key interventions, including technical um, and financial uh, resources that are needed to drive a response to, to these uh, pandemics. Um, in this LMRP, we, we also learned uh, that when we scan the environment for opportunities, uh, means we can put all our ducks in a row to align key stakeholders to prepare on preparedness uh, and therefore mitigate um, um, the, 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 the impact of uh, this future health crisis. And um, also uh, the work that we do needs a lot of um, adapting um, as the, 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 the pandemics uh, keep on evolving, we need to adapt our strategies. And uh, this enables us to revise our response plans as these emergencies continue to evolve um, along with other key stakeholders. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Great to hear um, how the LMRP has been able to help you increase your readiness. Uh, Yahya, what about you? How did the LMRP increase your readiness for future health crisis? Okay, um, because LMRP adopted its team approach. Uh, many people in my team, in fact, 80% are from risk communication and community engagement. Uh, units of the organization. And um, we're involved in all disease outbreak preparedness and response, including weather lassa fever, monkeypox, across different disease technical working groups. So our services are always required. And many of us join the organization. We've had training in different dimensions, but when it comes to training us to respond collectively to the pandemic, and this aligns with our mission, which says that is for the organization to protect the health of Nigerians through evidence-based prevention, integrated disease surveillance and response, using a one-led approach guided by research and led by a skilled workforce. I want to emphasize the skilled workforce there. Uh, this actually encourages the use of um, individual strengths and diverse perspectives. Um, the team supports uh, appreciation of uh, individual um, differences, uh, which usually come out during crisis. And then, and then the constructive feedback, our ability to receive feedback constructively and even provide feedback constructively, and ability to be able to become adaptive 
uh, during crisis. Um, the need for all of us to work together as stakeholders uh, is something that we really learned as a team. And uh, pandemics or emergencies is not something that one person can do alone. So uh, one more important thing we learned was the use of a challenge model and then um, problem tree analysis in solving uh, problems. I've been using that and my team too, we've been using that uh, in responding and preparing for uh, outbreaks. And then uh, these skills I think are very crucial for navigating the complex terrain, emergencies and ever evolving uh, situation we see uh, during the health crisis. And then the first, this program has also fostered team collaboration and then the culture of mutual support, uh, which was not really very there before. And then a sense of um, brotherhood uh, that we are together, we are all in this together. And that has eventually uh, promoted the acquisition of uh, different individual differences skills and then ensure to appear in a robust way for future emergencies. And I think um, it's the worthwhile program and then um, it has really strengthened our capacity to respond to different demands, pressures from different disease areas. And um, no matter how short um, time, you know, how short uh, the request uh, uh, is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yahya. Very well said. And I'm happy to hear uh, the improvement of your teamwork because that was another specific objective of the LMRP to strengthen uh, teamwork for you to be able to uh, to respond to emergencies. So um, now, uh, Julian, I will ask you the same question. To what extent did the LMRP help you prepare for future health crisis? Thank you, Awira, uh, for the question. Um, allow me to say that uh, one general realization, one general uh, idea is that most of the response efforts to any health uh, emergency require behavior change uh, process and uh, the behavior ch the process of be uh, changing the behavior is always through uh, constant education and sensitization uh, we realized with lmrp that uh, when you set a target and then conduct sensitization efforts towards that, uh, towards achieving that target uh, is not only applicable to driving up uh, vaccine rates as we did for, for our group, but also is applicable to any health uh, emergency and any health campaign. Today, for instance, in Rwanda, we are conducting the vaccine rollout for polio because uh, there was threats coming from um, different countries, different neighboring countries. And uh, what we, re we realize is that we, uh, we are applying the defining of threats, the defining of challenges, and uh, setting a target that we are conducting uh, our efforts towards as we roll out this vaccine. So it's not only for COVID-19, and it's not only for LMRP, it's, uh, it's techniques and skills that we can apply during our daily uh, work, during our daily efforts towards uh, conducting health campaigns. Thank you, Awira. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Julian. Uh, clearly, I can see and we, I can hear that uh, the LMRP um, achieved the objective it was meant to achieve. I will pose the same question to you, Dennis. To what extent did the LMRP program increase your readiness uh, for future health crisis. Thank you, Madam Mawira. For the Makweni team representing Kenya, the LMRP program enhanced the leadership and management capacities of the team in public emergency preparation, response, and recovery efforts to effectively manage future epidemic, pandemics, and responses. Early this year, we had a cholera outbreak in Makweni County. And courtesy of the LMRP, building our capacity as a team, we were able to effectively 
respond to the cholera outbreak. Of course, using stakeholder engagement, mapping, but key to note, the team spirit. We were able to manage the cholera outbreak in Makweni County within two weeks time. And therefore I would say the LMRP program has not only given us the know-how, the skills, but it has also given us tools to handle future pandemics. Thank you, Madam Awira. Excellent. Well said, well said. Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, same question to you, Maria. To what extent did the LMRP program increase your readiness for future health crisis? Yes, definitely it strengthen us as a team and all the work we've done with the community committees has allowed us because we're going through dengue epidemic. So these committees have helped us to control this scenario we are going through in our country since they're already organized, they are carrying out trainings related to dengue. They are organizing to, for families to identify in their homes critical situations to prevent getting sick. People have passed away and this has allowed us that the community, the municipality and health should all work together. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. It, uh, it's really exciting to hear how the, the LMRP has, um, you know, capacitated the teams uh, to, uh, to be able to tackle uh, other, pand uh, other, you know, crises that have come up after um, COVID-19. We've heard about uh, cholera. Now we are, we are hearing about the dengue fever. And so well done, uh, all the teams. Now I will turn it over to our audience uh, for a brief uh, question and answer session. And so I invite everyone to share uh, their questions for our panelists. You can do that by typing them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So uh, please um, post your questions, start posting your questions and our panelists will strive to respond. So I see a question for Julian. Uh, what kind of sensitization activities uh, did you implement, uh, Julian? Thank you, Awila. I was uh, actually trying to respond by writing, but uh, let me explain it in, in, in saying. We have conducted a set of different uh, sensitization activities, including uh, the different engagements. I have said the religious uh, leaders engagement because one of the uh, one of the challenges we had was people resisting the vaccine because of their religious beliefs. So uh, we the activities of using the religious leaders to anchor the message to be the source of the sensitization message has read to a great uh, a great difference in what we have seen in as far as uh, COVID-19 vaccination uptake was concerned. Second was to actually use the community platforms. There's a lot of community platforms, community work, community meetings where the members of one community go and discuss one issue or two issues and find a resolution to those issues. So we have worked with the Ministry of Local Government so that uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccination could be one of the agenda in the community meetings, in the, in the community uh, work, and so on and so forth. We have driven uh, media engagement so that we can spread the message through different media, especially radio to reach out uh, to uh, rural communities and so on and so forth. But also, in as far as the, uh, urban uh, communities are concerned, 
we have driven um, engagement with uh, social media influencers. We have even engaged a set of um, uh, artists to compose a song, uh, which was uh, really, really well received and driven uh, vaccine uptake. There's a lot of things that we have conducted uh, because we wanted to reach different communities with different uh, behaviors and different uh, backgrounds. So we have gone to uh, different uh, channels. Thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. uh, Julian. Uh, I think in the interest of time, we will move to the next uh, session. Uh, but I encourage you to keep posting the questions on the chat and uh, we will, uh, they will be responding to as, as, we, as we move along. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, the panelists, and uh, congratulations. Well done. Paul, over to you for the fourth um, and final panel. Thank you very much, Wawira, once again. Listening in, I see a lot of overlap between the preparedness to manage the future crisis and the next part, which is the teamwork and how the LMRP has helped the teams to become better. So these are things which are interrelated, they are complementary, they are all necessary if we're going to be prepared to address any future crisis. So I know this panel on teamwork probably has already said most of what they did in terms of how the LMRP helped them to improve in their team performance. But nevertheless, let me just ask uh, our colleagues. But before I do that, there are two quotes on the screen. And these two quotes are from the evaluation support that we had uh, presented by Nicole. And the first quote highlights ways that participating in the LMRP course has strengthened the sense of teamwork and how team members know, now recognize value and leverage other teammates' skills. That's a very important observation that you can be working with someone who is an expert in something, but if you don't know that he or she is doing that, you may never use that resource which is available. So the LMRP helps people to know a little more about the capacities that each member has and how to leverage that for the team action. The second quote highlights some ways in which participation in the course strengthen the informant leadership capabilities. So with that, I wanted to get some reactions from the panelists. Again, we are going through all the panelists and we're asking the question, to what extent has the LMRP influenced your teamwork and leadership? Let's begin with you, Simon, um, to share with us. Oh. Thank you very much, Paul. Um... Um, the work that we do involves uh, working with different regions. And um, in these different regions, we have what we call the regional emergency operation centers. So uh, the people in these regions work with um, uh, the people in the communities to, to do uh, different um, response efforts and also uh, preparedness efforts. So each region has uh, unique um, characteristics um, in terms of maybe culture and um, and um, you know, so socioeconomic backgrounds and everything. Um, so somehow um, within this LMRP, we have learned to listen to our different regional counterparts as we understand that uh, the uniqueness of these different regions will impact on how we respond to these different epidemics. And um, we allow them to make decisions. We allow them to 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 be free with us. And um, and uh, you know, we, we, we and, and therefore we, we sort of. Uh, quote unquote, we leave, we lead them uh, from behind. Um, we have been able to foster uh, open uh, communications with, um, with 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 our counterparts, um, um, with our different teams, and um, to understand what went well and what did not go well um, as we strategize um, um, for future um, 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 for future pandemics. And then also in, in my team, uh, even here the National EOC, it's a very, very high uh, intensity. Um, it's like a boiler room, the work that we do. Um, but somehow we, we have been able to manage 
to celebrate our successes together. There's always some cake to cut um, every once in a while, someone's birthday. So this kind of reduces on our stress as we uh, as we work hard um, every day. So that is how um, all this LMRP has been able to to influence our our teamwork. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. I like the listening that you are talking about. Listening is a key thing in leadership. But over to you, Yahaya. How has the LMRP helped you in terms okay, of teamwork uh, and leadership? Uh, let me start from leadership. Uh, LMRP has really shifted their leadership focus from a hero uh, who knows it all to to be issue focused. Instead of thinking of somebody who can solve all the problems that we center around issues and we see everybody as equals. And it's also collective rather than individual. And then even though we leverage on individual strengths, we recognize individual capabilities and then the, and then and the reference and where and weaknesses. Uh, but when we work together, it makes our work productive, our strength productive, and our weaknesses irrelevant. Uh, it is also dynamic. It is not one code suits or one solution suits all. So we learn how to be adaptive uh, in responding to issues, especially when we're dealing with um, complex issues, complex situations. So um, I've said that many times that it enables us to recognize the capability of uh, individuals and also respect their diverse perspectives and then fostering trust and transparent communication among the team. And that's one key thing that this has done for us, although it's work in progress. Uh, it has also enhanced uh, support for a shared vision, uh, prom promoting a clear understanding uh, of individual um, contributions to the uh, problems and the, uh, the team objectives. So uh, instead of just somebody creating a vision top down, but we all reason together to come up with a shared vision that everybody aligns with, that everybody uh, uh, has roles to play inside. And then um, it also encourages delegation. Uh, like if you know you have so many tasks, as a senior member in the team, you can delegate to other people because you now have confidence in these team members that they can do uh, more than what you used to think that they can do. And the future challenge because you already have the school, the, the tools, the skills, and the, the mental readiness uh, to be able to face any challenge. So overall, uh, MLMRP has um, provided a comfortable environment for team members to express their opinions and therefore making everybody's voice count and heard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yahaya. Julian, how has it been for you? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I would say that um, my answer will technically go back to what uh, Yahya has shared with us. But um, LMRP has influenced our teamwork uh, in the fact that it helped us uh, leverage individual skills uh, and uh, channel strength from different individuals with uh, different backgrounds and different uh, personalities and channel them to where they can benefit uh, the whole group in the realization of a set uh, target, of a set result. So we realized that uh, people's strength and people's um, knowledge and skills, they are different, uh, and they are different in uh, they are di different in you know from individuals to individuals. But it takes swift leadership to allocate those strengths, those skills, and those knowledge to where they are most uh, mostly due. So this is uh, how the LMRP program has influenced our teamwork and uh, leadership skills. Thank, thank you, you, thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. I like the fact that we, are, we have different skills. 
<laughs> and we need to... Sorry, someone speaking? So over to you, Dennis. What do you think has helped you in terms of strengthening the team skills and the teamwork and leadership? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Waibale. Uh, for Makwini County, we have had a leadership, a change of mindset since beginning the LMRP uh, program, but whereby as a team, we are not competing, but we are complementing each other towards a shared vision. It has taught us that for a team to work, you need to have a shared vision that is resonating with the entire team to avoid a scenario of where we are operating in silos. We need synergy. The LMRP program clearly highlighted how truly we are interdependent as a health workforce and the need for committed and motivated health teams. Of course, it brought about the leading and managing skills by uncovering leadership capabilities among the team and providing us the platform to practice those leadership and management skills. And key to note is when the COVID-19 came as a county and even globally, each and every country operated in a silo. It took time before we had a standard. It took time before all of the countries and as a county and even as a country, we aligned everything. And therefore one thing that is a standalone for leadership, for, for the LMRP program on teamwork and leadership is that the box stops with the leader, with the team. And there is need for us to mentor other leaders and ensure that the pipeline is filled with the leaders for succession. Thank you. Well, I've given you a thumbs up on that. And with that, let me invite Maria to share with us on the same aspect of teamwork and leadership. Over to you, Maria, please. Good evening, Good evening. Yes, definitely. As a matter of fact, it has allowed us to identify our abilities and strengthen our interpersonal skills and analyze and prioritize the problems that may come up. But we've understood that this work is very important, the empowerment towards the community and that not the whole load is towards health but for it to be something shared and that we can have a lot of accomplishments and success when we work together as one. And definitely, this is for the health of our population. Therefore, our theme is to work together hand by hand in benefit of the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, panelists. In the interest of time, I just want to thank you for your elaborate responses. And I know we'll continue this discussion. We will not have the QA session because of time, but I know most of the questions that have come in the chats have been answered. So let me now hand it over to Katie for any last comments and next steps. Thank you, Katie, over to you. Great, thank you, Paul. And thank you panelists for leading this insightful conversation on what it means to be resilient in the face of public health emergencies. Um, I just wanna take a minute to thank and highlight uh, the valuable partnerships that pave the way for the LMRP to be implemented across diverse teams and countries. Please take a look at the slide at all of the different agencies and partners um, that were involved, many of which were active in the chat today, um, and we see you. Um, 
Thank you so much for your active participation and interest in this. There are a few questions remaining in the chat we didn't get to. Some about really important issues around how could these programs be embedded and sustained. Um, we're working at the, on that now in Kenya with the Kenya Medical Training College. Um, but I think that's a that's a opportunity for, for elsewhere. And so um, again, we'll be following up with a recording um, and some of the materials from this webinar, as well as contact information. We'd love to continue the conversation with any and all of you. Um, if you have questions about how these materials could potentially be applied in your context, um, please please reach out because we'd love to, to try to make that possible and to share what we've learned. So thank you again. Um, I wish you a very lovely rest of your Thursday. Um, and and uh, we look forward to the next time that we can uh, gather together. So thank you so much. Uh, please feel free to send any remaining thoughts in the chat. And again, we will circulate any answers to the questions and the webinar materials in the coming days. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you.